Welcome to Athens, the um, the um, the the capital of cognitive cogni cognition, <laughs> or the point of origin of all this good stuff, or one of them. Um, we um, uh, in, a, in a moment, Professor Anna Brillman of the Max Planck Institute, along with her esteemed colleagues, Nico Salingaros, Richard Taylor, and Anjan Chatterjee, will treat us to a conversation among experts at the highest scientific level revolving around their neuroscientific, aesthetic, and mathematical interests. This is the classic Planning Institute fractal round table. And this is where actually the TAG event started through a misunderstanding among us whether we, our fractal round table was gonna be public or private. We, at the Institute, we thought of it as being part of our research internal because we are trying to figure out uh, what happens in the human brain when you walk down the street. Much of what um, Professor, um, uh, much, much of uh, what Professor, um, uh, Creer talked about, you could actually parse out in neuroscientific or neuroaesthetic terms very clearly. Uh, uh, for example, when he was talking about the vernacular and the classical and showing those diagrams of the various type of types of columns and their designs and such. <clears throat> but what we found was that despite the existence of scientific toys and tools such as eye tracking glasses, fMRIs, EEGs, and so on, and all the data that has been collected by so many people from very, very many disciplines in neuroscience, no one knows much about, for sure, about urban biometrics. And while the siloing of disciplines and interests promotes the collection of much information, urban neuroscience is apparently in its infancy. So as a working group, the purpose of the Fractal Roundtable is to sequence what happens in the brain of a human walking down the street. My hope is that we can define a keystone experiment to underpin what we theorize regarding the experience of the built environment and which will explain why traditional classical buildings, for example, are better for people than alternatives pro pro uh, proposed in their stead. And many other things that I think we wanna we live in a very special time in history. We have access to a lot of technology that was not available. And I don't know for how long it will continue to be available. And communication devices, which right now we use, but who knows where they're going to be in terms of trustworthiness and, and operation. So we are really in a special time. Let's take full advantage of it. I hand the floor over to Professor Brielman from Max Planck. Take it away, please. Thank you so much, Nir, and well, thank you for um, uh, uh, granting me an honorary professor title, which is not quite too, true yet, and maybe in the future, while I do hold a PhD, that Generically, is you're a professor. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited um, to be sort of moderating uh, the discussion panel today, and uh, even more excited to be joined by my colleagues, Professor Salingoras, uh, Professor Chetji, and Professor Taylor. And so uh, the idea behind this discussion panel is that we will spend approximately 25 to 30 minutes on four main questions with hopefully many joyful detours along the way, and then open the floor to questions from the audience for the remainder of the session. So please feel free to type away in the chat window if you happen to uh, have a question, don't wait until the bitter end. We usually tend to forget about those questions. And I'll come back to those questions um, in those final 20 minutes. So to get us all started, uh, I would really love if each of you, uh, Nikos, Anja, and Richard, uh, could give the audience a brief introduction about who you are and what your interest is and how it links to this topic of cognitive architecture. So maybe Nikos, if you want to get uh, start. Yes, I'm honored to, to begin. I'm a mathematician and physicist and uh, also a professor of architecture. And I'm interested in how uh, architecture um, impacts the user. So this is a neuroscientific question, but I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, I, I have approached this question through mathematics. 
because what neuroscience does is to uh, solve mathematical questions of information compression and interpretation that our body does. So our body is a, a, an analog computer that computes information from the environment and it, uh, the, that helps us to survive. So uh, this is sort of a missing, a missing piece. I think it's an important missing piece that, that we can analyze the patterns that we see when we, when we look at the environment, when we walk down the street, when we face a window, when we face a wall, uh, because um, uh, the information has to be uh, uh, treated mathematically and it has certain, uh, certain uh, characteristics that uh, uh, affect our survival. So we recognize things that are good for us and then we also recognize things that are bad for us and the other stuff we ignore because it has no meaning on our, um, uh, on our survival. And so this, this is what we uh, come, come back independently when we do neuroscience measurements because we find that yes, uh, the, uh, the human being and the perceptive system is, a, is an analog computer that has evolved to compute precisely this, uh, this information and, and we have an innate reaction to it. So this is really, um, well, having said that, which sounds uh, abstract and scientific, let me <laughs> conclude. This is a revolution in architecture because now we can use the neuroscience, we can use the eye tracking, uh, we can use the software that mimics the eye tracking to completely uh, uh, um, uh, revolutionize the, the way we have been interpreting designs because some designs that are hated by the classical people and everyone, most people here are, 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 are classical people, but not all. Um, uh, the designs that, uh, that people do not like turn out to have these negative connotations for the, for the body because mathematically they cannot be compressed. They do not have uh, important uh, and useful information. So on the one side, uh, the, the uh, tradition of classical architecture, and this is what Nir uh, is very excited about, the tradition of classical architecture is uh, validated uh, from a scientific point of view, not just aesthetics and history, it's old, so it must be good. That's, there is some truth to that, but that's not what we're doing here. Uh, and on the I other hand- I start into the discussion because- um, Okay, okay. That is, so, that is amazing. Let, let I think you, you almost yeah. dove into, into all the questions all at once in your introduction already. Okay, I, I, will, I, will, I will be quiet now. <laughs> Uh, Richard, would you maybe like to do a few introductory words and maybe you already have a response for Nikos or something <laughs> that itches? No, I, I uh, always enjoy listening to Nikos, so uh, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so briefly, um, I'm a professor of uh, physics, psychology and art, and um, that might seem really unusual. Um, to me, it seems very natural, but what ties all of those areas together for me is an interest in nature's patterns, and in particular, bio-inspiration and biomimicry. Can we learn from them? Um, and in terms of today's uh, discussion, I've always been drawn by the, you know, the biophilia movement, this idea that you've got an, an innate need to connect with nature, and in particular, in the 1990s, some very profound psychology experiments that just highlighted that just looking out of a window out on nature can have huge impacts in terms of stress reduction and reduction in mental fatigue. And although powerful and power pioneering, staring out at nature, they never really answered, well, what is that essential quality that's triggering all of these positive things in the human body? And for me, that's what I've become interested in. And when you look out at nature, many natural scenes have these things called fractal patterns in them. And fractals are just patterns that repeat at different size scales. And I use the word just because it is a simple idea, but it's the basic building block of many natural scenes. So for example, clouds and trees and mountains and coastlines and lightning are all fractal. And so over the last 20 years, I've been collaborating with psychologists, looking at what is the impact on humans when they look at these fractals. And we've developed a model called fractal fluency. And it means just that, that through evolution, because we've been surrounded by these fractal patterns, our visual systems have become fluent in the visual language of fractals. So when we look at a fractal, 
we find it from a, a neuroscience point of view very easy to process and that ushers in an aesthetic experience which is accompanied by a massive dramatic uh, stress reduction and so all of these experiments are very interesting and what i would really like to do is to make it reality so i think that this is a great opportunity to have both science informed design and architecture but also as nikos hinted at human centered uh, design and architecture and so i've just started to do projects such as i'm working with um, mohawk to develop stress reducing carpeting i'm working with another company with stress reducing noise reducing ceilings and also fractal solar panels and fractal blinds and things like that so there's many opportunities to incorporate fractals into the insides and outsides of buildings. And so that's that's what I'm interested in talking about today. And I can already see the connection between the two of you, right? So we do have Nico's uh, uh, emphasis on information processing uh, and the inherent sort of information uh, st informational structure of fractals inherent in, in your topic, right? So I think that will yeah. make for an interesting point of connection there. Uh, and last but not least, we have Anjan Chatterjee joining us. Anjan, would you like to introduce yourself briefly as well? Sure. <clears throat> so I'm a neurologist and a cognitive neuroscientist. And over the last 30 years, I've worked on different things, including spatial attention, um, language. Um, we've been thinking about abstract concepts for a while. And then in the last 20 years, I've been working on neuroaesthetics. And as an outcrop of that over the last several years, we've been interested in architecture. And the way what I have to say, I think links up with what both Richard and Nico said is that if your interest in architecture is centered on humans, then you have to know something about humans. And that means that you have to know something about how our brain works. So our general, the general model with, that we approach both aesthetics and architecture is really thinking of three large scale systems. One having to do with the sensory and motor uh, properties of our brain. So this might relate to uh, the way in which our visual system perhaps uh, responds to uh, specific patterns. Fractals might be one of them. Uh, so that's a design feature of the sensory system. Uh, it relates to motor systems in the way that it's relevant to architecture is that these are spaces that we navigate through. And uh, there's uh, a lot of interesting work in neuroscience <clears throat> of spatial navigation, which I have done very little, so I don't claim to be an expert, but you may know that in 2014, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine went to people who were working out some of the neuroscience of navigation. So that's another area where I think neuroscience has something to say about urban design, about architecture, insofar as these are spaces through which we move. Uh, but going back to the triad, we, we talk about the sensory motor properties of our nervous system. Uh, and then what are the emotional and reward systems involved? So if it's typically beauty, we think beauty is directly linked to pleasure, uh, that without pleasure, there isn't the, the human experience of, of beauty, but pleasure is not, the, and it's not the only aesthetic experience. We can have all sorts of nuanced experiences like the sublime or uh, even dread, uh, you know, so trying to understand the emotional landscape, and that's a metaphor, but emotional uh, landscape in our responses to artifacts in the world, which includes both art and other people and uh, built environment. Uh, and then finally, the third piece of the triad is the, the semantic and knowledge system. And this is where our personal backgrounds, our histories, our culture, even what point in history we happen to be living in that has uh, that modifies and modulates uh, the things out of which we get uh, pleasure. And so one uh, general uh, strategy for most scientists is trying to account for variance. You know, what is common variance of how people all respond and what's, what's the variance that can't be explained by that but still has structure. So that's a general kind of framework that we use in trying to pose these questions. 
Thank you so much, Anjan. I do, I do think we all have a lot in common, um, perhaps for uh, complacency sake. Uh, I am the, uh, I'm another trained psychologist here and around. Um, I got my PhD in experimental psychology and as of now I'm working in computational neuroscience. So I'm trying to bridge the gap between um, computer science, mathematics, uh, psychology, neuroscience, uh, being somewhat ill-trained in most of these fields, but um, always eager to learn. Uh, and I, most of my work uh, focuses on, on the experience of beauty. But um, much like Nikos and, and Richard and Anjan have uh, all uh, already mentioned, I do believe that uh, beauty is experienced in a much larger framework of um, our brains having evolved as somewhat uh, useful things to us in, in everyday life. Uh, and as, as such, the experience of beauty has to fit in that picture. Uh, and currently you know, very much trying to understand beauty as sort of a signal of um, progress towards better information processing, which might uh, just about help us to finally pin down what beauty is all about. And what beauty might also be about uh, when we talk about architecture. And um, so I guess the, the first question I really wanted to tackle with you is um, even going to, to the very basics underlying that. So when uh, we as, as mathematicians and as scientists talk about how we experience architecture, uh, then there is the, the baseline question really, how, how do we do that, right? Which, which mechanism underlie our experience of, of architecture or uh, the environment at large? And, um, you know, I'm just going, going to throw that out there. I would say uh, we experience it like we experience everything else around there in, in the world. Uh, we come uh, with our expectations and those expectations shape what we experience, um, but also our experience kind of gives us feedback uh, as to whether or not our experiences were correct. And then um, the what, what comes out of that and then determines our actions is a product of, of both of these. Um, and perhaps it is a good idea for architecture to um, fall into um, a golden middle between those two things where uh, our expectations aren't uh, violated all the time, but at the same time still um, give us some new information to, to become better at processing our environment. So uh, I'd be curious what, what you have to say about these fundamental um, mechanisms underlying how we process our environment. Uh, Anna, please, please call on whoever you want to speak. Oh, I, I, I'd leave it up to you. To, to you, you can, you can fight for the first one to, <laughs> to talk. I'm, I'm sure four people at a time can figure it out. I can have a stab at first. I mean, one of the interesting things I find is this sort of uh, balance between nature and nurture, you know, and I think that many people get a little, particularly, I think, in terms of um, people coming from the art world and art theorists, they get very nervous when you start talking about neuroaesthetics and automatic processes because they have a tendency to think that everything should be to do with cultural and emotional and intellectual considerations. But uh, an awful lot of what we experience is what we call automatic processes in the visual system that unfold on the millisecond level and build up uh, a sort of baseline aesthetic experience. And so it's a mixture of two things. It's a mixture of these sort of automatic processes that are sort of biology and neuroscience, but then gradually mixing in with cognitive intellectual experiences. And you could imagine it's almost like two waves of aesthetics. You might have an initial wave is based on all of these biological processes and set a background, and then in come all of the sort of cognitive, cultural, historical, sort of aspects that you bring to when you look at uh, a building. Um, so I know people get very anxious about that sometimes, but I actually think that that's where all the fun and games of aesthetics actually start. So Richard, if I could follow up on that, what is the source of the anxiety? 
uh, because it seems to me this, these are very sensible claims and uh, the idea that people have a reflexive reaction to just about everything and then on reflection, either you, you confirm or elaborate on that or you decide, no, that my reflexive reaction wasn't right. But what, what, what is the piece that is disturbing to people with that general claim? Mm -hmm. Well, a great example is that I studied the artist Jackson Pollock, uh, the abstract expressionist, and I actually used computer programs to analyze the patterns in the paintings and, um, you know, and found that they had this sort of fractal content to it. Um, and then that kind of linked into this question of, okay, so is the reason why people like Pollock paintings, is it because, um, you know, it reminds them of nature? And so that's how I kind of actually started mm. down this road of thinking mm. about aesthetics from a, you know, from a, a neuroscience point of view. And uh, a lot of art theorists got very defensive about that idea, you know, that they felt that abstract expressionism had to be understood uh, in terms of an intellectual assessment, you know, in terms of was Pollock how was Pollock combining expressionism with cubism and things like that? Very sort of intellectual questions, rather than talking about what's actually going on in the brain. You know, and some art theorists felt that you needed to read books and books and books about Jackson Pollock to fully appreciate Pollock. When in fact, a lot of my experience shows that you could actually just have somebody who's never even aware of art history. You can put them in front of this image and they're going to get a valid aesthetic experience out of it. I've made some of the experiences. There's a deep anxiety about people from from a background, um, say, in art history or in, in the humanities about taking away the special from aesthetics, sometimes even within the scientific community of people who sort of identify as I'm doing empirical aesthetics when one says, well, you look at the basic cognitive, you said biological mechanisms, the visual perceptual mechanisms, they're just the same. And I, I personally agree uh, on, on that stance, though I, I would want to poke at you uh, and ask when you say biological, do you mean innate? Or do you mean, you know, rather automatic in the sense that it's just quick, but yet shaped by experience? Yeah, I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, you don't need to have gone away and read, you don't need to spend five minutes of cognitive thinking about something to, to get the experience that some things like relaxation, whatever, can unfold without you even being aware of why this thing relaxes you. So these sort of levels where the, I think, belong beyond sort of intellectual deliberation, I think is what I mean. Well, I think it's definitely below, uh, beyond intellectual deliberation. I don't think intellectual deliberation is necessary to appreciate art. And I don't think artists think this way when they're creating a work of art and uh, or a great work of architecture. Uh, it has really nothing to, my battery's going to run out here. Oh, well, I'll just talk for a moment and then recharge, but it is not something that it, we don't, unless you want to create robots that replicate visual experiences, this kind of data mining is really unnecessary. I think it's very human to be in awe of beauty. We can't really describe what it is, but we know it when we see it often. And there are cultural differences. Jews appreciate beauty, uh, the beauty of ideas more than uh, uh, in the Western tradition where people believe that um, uh, 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 they're more interested in monuments and the beauty of monuments. There's different kinds of cultural expressions, but I'm really, truly, unless you want to start building robots to perceive uh, beauty because you think that they should replace human beings, then, then I think perhaps your, your work is worthwhile, but I find it rather uh, disturbing and really nothing to do with art or architecture or the eye and the hand, the, the process of making art, the process of, of building a building, the process of being creative, which I think is immeasurable. I mean, it's not measurable. 
Uh, I would like to, <laughs> may, may I jump in to... Uh, of course, Nikos, please yes, do feel free. Um, um, I want to, uh, to tell Anjan that there is a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance in our society because uh, biological, visceral beauty is felt by everyone. It is the, the common human being because it is, it is part of our evolution. So we react as, as, um, uh, as, uh, as the experiments show, we react instinctively to the, this type of beauty. Very separate is the cultural and learned beauty, which you have to read several books to appreciate something. And that, if that, if that uh, it goes in the same direction and agrees with the visceral beauty, then everything is fine. If on the other hand, it is opposite, then you get rise to cognitive dissonance because you feel something, you look at a wor artwork, it makes you sick. You look at the building, it gives you anxiety. You think it's gonna fall down. It, it will make you sick in the long term because it creates anxiety. So, uh, but then that building has been valid validated by an important architectural prize. All the media praise it for a wonderful work of art. So you get cognitive dissonance. So uh, it is my contention that uh, most of our society lives in a state of permanent cognitive dissonance. So that's the problem. And now in the chats, my good friend, Mark Hewitt has accused you of Anjan of being too soft on modernist aesthetics which really <laughs> some modernist aesthetics uh, are polemic against, uh, against the more classical aesthetics. Now, that doesn't have to be classical against modernist because if we use just the neuroscience response that we can validate which modernist buildings or, or, or any style give a very good, uh, a positive, uh, healthy feeling. So it is no question of styles anymore. The science that we have that we are talking about in this session enables us to answer these old questions that gave rise to tremendous controversies and people shouting at each other. Uh, we can answer those questions now. It's going to make some people upset, you know, because they would like to, to keep the intellectual uh, stuff from, you know, decades. But, you know, sometimes something has to go if, if it's useless. And just as a, as, as a little aside for Anjan, Mark Hewitt also just said that you're an excellent scientist. So bear that in mind when you answer Nikos's question, <laughs> maybe. Sure, uh, I, think, uh, I think from uh, my understanding of Mark's mm -hmm. comment is that I'm too soft on modernists. And I think, the, uh, I think that's a mischaracterization of my position. Uh, I think what in my book, the, where I do talk about conceptual art, I think as a scientist, you can't, you can't just rely on traditional art and say you're saying something. Uh, I mean, you can say something, but you still have to confront the problem of conceptual art, of modern art. And using my triad, the, the, the argument was in terms of modern art is this is where semantics and knowledge comes in. And this is analogous to what Nikos is saying that you have to, you have to know a fair amount to understand what the conversation is that's going on. And you can still choose to like it or not like it, but it would be like, uh, like stepping into a conversation, Nikos, if you're speaking Greek, you know, I might have some low level sense of the mentality and the beauty of the sound, but I would, you know, the meaning is completely opaque to me. Uh, on the other hand, if you're reciting beautiful Greek poetry, if I know some of the beauty, that's going to change my complete experience of it. Similarly with, uh, with uh, Persian calligraphy. So I think meaning is an, is an important piece to this. When, you, when my claim was that when you get to conceptual art, almost everything resides in the meaning portion of it and not the lower level sensory motor qualities because those are completely trivial, right? In the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you can stick up a urinal on a pedestal and people say, this is the most profound piece of art of the 20th century. There's nothing about the visual features of that that makes it so. What do you think about history enhancing the knowledge of, of, of history about something enhancing its beauty. I think that's what we're talking about here. The qualities, not the quantities, not the, the fact that something can be measured mathematically, but that something can be appreciated because we have somewhat of an appreciation of its historical context or its, um, 
I, I guess it's historical context. I'm an architectural historian and I value uh, knowing something about uh, the past in order to appreciate a work of art. And uh, that enhances my appreciation. It enables me to see better, but why would I want to quantify that experience into bytes or bits or digital neuro information when uh, I want to experience it on an aesthetic level? Uh, I, I don't quite understand what you scientists. Is, is, is this room is Athens? I, I, I think, I, Susan, I so much appreciate your, your critical, crit, really critical concern. It's a, a, a crisp and very critical concern. I think as scientists, we believe that uh, the understanding on a bits and bytes level, so to say, uh, does, not, does not prevent the experience at all. Um, it is just a, well, the driven curiosity about, about the why does not, not prevent the experience, so to say. And I do think that um, uh, the, the comments of, of Nikos and, and Richard and Anja and combined actually draw a, a really nice picture here um, of saying, on the one hand, there is a very low level automatic response to how we process the bits and bytes and the makeup of our sensory cognitive system and it sort of chimes. But then there's also an element that may be um, well, a little bit more prominent, if I understood Anjan correctly, when it comes to, to abstract and conceptual art culture? that might not relate so much to the immediate experience of, say, beauty or pleasure, but that is rather, um, might, might be even a different experiential level. Well, what about human experience rather than just mechanistic experience? Uh, it's it's in, I mean, what, what we're saying is that it's not one or the other, both are valid experiences. And um, I think the skill of the designer, whether it's architect or a, an artist, is to play, to have an interplay between those two things. You know, so for example, where I'm coming from, of looking at, uh, you know, all of the processes about why we like nature, well, you know, you're not gonna build a building with nature in it. A building is different from nature. And so when you start to talk about the built environment, then you've got to bring in all of these extra factors, you know, but the, the, they are, but the neuro- um, Do you think the Brown used this kind of neural analysis to design picture of as parks in, in, in England? Oh, I, mean, I, think, I think many artists are very aware of, uh, you know, their, their inner experiences that are partly unfolding from neuroaesthetics. But why do we have to Could, put that into kids? Can't we just allow them to be creative and to enjoy the creative experience rather than having to analyze it on a superficial level? It's like, uh, when does it all begin? And the could, could I speak as well? <laughs> Yes, I would um, love so, to yeah, more. I just wanted to maybe introduce a little bit could, more, more, more order. Into yes, I could, could I appreciate your comment. I do think we're a little bit stuck here on, on the understanding of whether there's some mutual exclusiveness to, to those two kinds of experiences or, yes. or not. Um, and I could, could I could I speak? Speaking, could I speak as well? Um, Mark, if I could put you one step back, because there was um, Alejandro uh, I believe, who had a question like five or, or seven minutes ago. So I really like, I hope him, her, them uh, like to, to speak up. Uh, can you hear me properly? I don't know if it's- Yes, all kind perfectly. Of okay, so first off, I'd like to clarify, I'm not an architect nor an urban designer. I'm more specialized in public administration, but uh, regardless, I think there's something that can be sort of rescued from what everyone has said here. And I've read about urban design, something that was very interesting. And that was how people react to roundness or to curvature in things. They are more appealed to curvature. This is something that we see in biology. Precisely, it's less threatening. But when we look at classical architecture, although it tries to imitate nature very clearly in, for instance, Gothic windows and in the columns, it tries to imitate floral patterns it tends to be more angular. So there can be a discussion there of how people might be, for instance, more rejectful of a more curvature design in Frank Gehry than something that is more angular, such as a, the Parthenon, right? And here comes my, my question. I, and I think here there's something that's important. Materials have also been seen to 
uh, influence how people perceive something. For instance, more natural materials, rocks, cement, feel more uh, pleasurable than to see, for instance, steel and glass. And that's something that might be attributed to Susan. Perhaps this angular traditional designs, aside from the very neat characteristics that try to imitate nature, are more pleasurable because they have this historical familiarity that makes us culturally, like that cultural understanding that is detached from the general human understanding might increase that pleasurability at a local cultural level and make it more attractive regardless of for, for, uh, maybe those different uh, angularities or more threatening design choices. For instance, Art Deco, very angular, very attractive in America. Could, could I could I speak to that? Uh, could I speak to that? Um, I, I'm, I don't know. Let's see. Um, uh, this is Mark Hewitt. Um, um, I, first of all, classical architecture is, in fact, uh, not an angular architecture at all. Um, it is, in, it is a, um, it is a, uh, an architecture of of sensuous curves. Um, the entasis and columns contain by uh, uh, sensuous curves, and of course, uh, it is very, very biomorphic. There's no question that um, that the arch that classical architecture is biomorphic. Classical ornament is biomorphic, and and so when Leon Creer is talking about um, vernacular and classical architecture as essentially um, based on plant forms, based on human forms, uh, humans do in fact uh, relate to it on both an intellectual and at a visceral or instinctual level. I also wanted to answer Anjan's uh, 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 suggestion in his book that he needs to talk about conceptual art. I, b I believe he's correct that he has to talk about conceptual art. There's no question that conceptual art is the prevalent form of art in the world today. It wasn't always that way. And conceptual art is done on an intellectual basis and is often uh, not sensual in any way, although there is, there is some conceptual art. Uh, uh, Maria Ivanovich's, Abramovich's work is, is highly sensual. But um, when Leon is, is talking about classical art as being about craft, about artisanship, about the, 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 the making of things, that involve an artisanal process, uh, most traditional art does that. And alas, a lot of contemporary art, uh, e even in its use of traditional media, such as paint and, and painting and drawing and so on, eschews the craftsman, uh, the craft-like art, uh, an artisanal aspect of art as it has been traditionally practiced. And of course, using traditional media and materials. So I think um, we classicists are, are, are acutely aware that um, there is a disconnect between conceptual art and architecture and our point of view that traditional art uh, is is very different, and it that traditional art does allow us to respond to beauty on a on a very visceral and sensual and instinctual basis. Thank you. I, I would like to, you, to jump in to to answer Alejandro because uh, Bill Browning, just an expert in biophilia, just wrote in the chats. Biophilia really encapsulates in a very simple way estimates of what are attractive. There are, there are several, uh, 10 or 14 biophilic properties and you can measure them. Curvature is one of them, but curvature on all scales. Frank Gehry has curvature on the largest scale, but eliminates vertical symmetry. So it is anxiety inducing, it doesn't do any good. And on the other hand, classical architecture has strict bilateral symmetry, which is reassuring, but has curvatures on the intermediate and small scales. So if you look at these indices that have been worked by people working on biophilia, it answers all your questions. There is another, another index which has the detail, and that's the, if that addresses your natural materials. The detail is much more attractive than the brutalist concrete of Le Corbusier and other people. So the, these have, this has been done. It's not widely known, but if you go into the people who, who talk about and apply biophilia, they have developed all of this, and you can, and you can estimate those. Thank you very much. 
see raised hands. Anne Sussman uh, is <laughs> trying to get our attention, apparently. So oh, I was. You know, I, like I, to... think, I think. I think. I uh, think. The one thing I guess I would say is uh, biometrics. Companies like iMotion, 3M's visual attention software. Biometrics define your world. Car companies. Um, business school students, they're measuring your autonomic nervous system. They're measuring the amount of times you smile. They're designing cars that are heated steering wheels but they, they, because they know that that'll control your subliminal brain more and you will feel more attached um, to the car. So the thing is, the terrifying thing that I see is the neuroscience is here. The neuroscience is marketed heavily by companies like iMotions and 3M to get people to buy more stuff. Um, architects and urban planners, developers don't know about this. They don't realize they're designing incredibly unhealthy streetscapes for people because they don't. Uh, there's no bio requirement to become a licensed architect. Uh, that's it's, it's really a travesty. We're in this turning point where the sciences are just being used in our capitalist economy to make people buy stuff. And when the business schools, it's stunning. The business school in Worcester, 20 miles away from my, the students have an eye tracking lab. What business school, what architecture school or college has an eye tracking lab? It's stunning. It's also has um, the uh, the car yeah. companies. They, they, you know, they, they use spatial expression analysis. It, it's stunning what they're doing. So um, they're, they're completely. You can compl the technology is there to completely understand how the nervous system and how you work before you consciously are aware of it. And everybody's designing for it, except the architectural academy, which is lost in the 20th century. I'll talk about it more for 10 minutes when I talk next uh, tomorrow. But I think that's it. The, the biometrics are already here. Oh my God, if you Google it, biometrics are expected to be, I think, $34 billion business by 2025 or something. Yeah, yeah. And everything. Which I think sounds to, I don't know, maybe, maybe Anjan, you also want to com comment on it, but I, I used to work a lot with eye tracking, right? So. Um, this, this was the bread and butter of, of my, uh, my, uh, my early master's uh, work. And I know how unreliable these measures are. And it's great if you, if you do market it, but all these measures are uh, what we call noisy. So there's, there's, there's error uh, rate. No, I, I would argue that, have you, do, I would argue those, that you're not using, you are not using the technology the car companies are using. Honda, no, no, it's, it's, it is. Are you using their technologies? It, it it does not really measure because all these these connections that the the companies of course advertise these um, these measurements as being hyper precise and and telling you exactly where somebody's attention is, but for instance with eye movements and I'm just talking about eye movements because I, I know these fairly well as um, the claims usually go, um, people's attention is where their uh, eyes fixate and that is true to some extent. It's a really good indicator of where we currently put. A, um, what we call conscious attention, um, but we can also attend to things that we are not looking at, and we all know that. Um, for instance, when we're driving in our car, and we have to watch the street, but at the same time, we can pay attention to, um, you know, the, the person, the person next to us. Well, well I, I've worked with eye tracking for five years now, and I would, argue, and I use the same technology that the Honda, BMW, and GM use. I use eye motions, and what I'd say is that it's it's shocking. It's shocking because when you relate it with uh, autonomic ner nervous system arousal, you suddenly see the world completely differently. And you see how powerful those companies are because they're using these technologies. I don't know what they're exactly doing, but they're driving advertising, they're driving everything. Just the, American consumer, the American consumer's attention is completely hijacked by neuroscience. Anja, yes, uh, I, I, yes, I want to hear Anja. I was just gonna make a comment that about eight years ago, I wrote a, a paper called brain branding and it was this specific thing about the use of neuroscience for commercial um, um, commercial endeavors and really talked about three distinct levels in which neuroscience was misused for commercial purposes so uh, i mean i think neuroscience you know and and the way it's used for marketing is a whole different question uh, there was a, a, a paper, not written by me, but one that was called The Seductive Allure of Neuroscience, uh, in which it uh, demonstrated that explanations, uh, as long as there were some neuroscience words in it, independent of whether it was a reasonable explanation for a phenomena, people tended to believe it. Uh, so I think there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of 
uh, misunderstanding of how neuroscience is used in various domains that can be used for ill or could be used for good. But, it, but you're exactly right. And this is something you know, I wrote about about eight or 10 years ago. Well, it's, thank, it's, you. It's, thank you very, very much. I'm, uh, I think we need to move on. This has, this has really scraped the, the, the surface of this topic, as you can see. And it, it's a topic that a lot of people get excited about once they get into it. Um, like the rabbi told, like in the story, the, the couple's uh, is coming to get a divorce and the rabbi, the woman uh, gives her spiel and the rabbi says, you're right. And then the husband gives his spiel and the rabbi says, you're right. And the husband says, how is it possible we're both right? Well, I can tell you all that you're all right. There's, there is an aspect here definitely of the, uh, we are all blind people describing an elephant kind of a thing, especially when it comes to the urban. Um, I'm being told that we have to close out the, the room and we have a link here in the chat window for the previous session. We had a snafu with that, with that link. So this is a link that works. Um, I, I really wanna thank um, the panel and the participants. I agree with everything I have heard. And uh, I, I, you know, to uh, make a pitch for, for my own chapter six in the art of classic planning from an urban standpoint and an, an urban aesthetic standpoint, try to start packaging this material. Uh, uh, discussions I've had with uh, some, some of, uh, of the professors here um, really came to the point of, we need to define what we're actually talking about because when we use the word sublime, for example, what exactly does it mean? And it means something completely different in German than it does in, in English and yada, yada, yada. So I wanna thank Professor, Professor Chatterjee who has led the neuroaesthetic world um, in the broadest possible sense in the last 15, 20 years. Um, and his, uh, I think it was a student of yours uh, with the, the curved shapes. Uh, thank you for, for being here and commenting. Thank you, Ms. Dickey as well and, and Mark. We, lo we love you. Everything that w everybody's saying is correct. Just has to, you know, it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle has to be put together. Mm -hmm. Professor Salingaros, thank you very much. You're among the only um, uh, in, in the um, mathematical urban realm at first, surely. Uh, Professor Taylor, you've been an inspiration. It was really your research that allowed me to write my book. I would not have uh, approached uh, matters of design without having some science behind it, even if it was mistakenly applied, I think not so much. And Professor Brielman, thank you for, um, for coordinating this and for um, bringing your combined, uh, actually, Anne Brielman is one of the people who are actual artists or are actual artists in this group. So art, psychology, Neuroscience together. Sitting. Thank you very much, uh, Anne Sussman, also for participating in this. We look forward to your talk tomorrow. All right, everybody go back to the main room. Okay. They're chasing us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.